So we continue in our series on 2 Thessalonians. We're in chapter 2, and we are at verse 13. We'll read to the end of the chapter there. In uh, the NIV, the heading is Stand Firm. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits, or if you see on the bottom, from the beginning, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. This is the word of the Lord, and we'll meditate on these powerful words this morning. Beloved congregation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Paul now is coming to the end of the the main part of his letter. He has been talking to the Thessalonians, many of them who were discouraged because they thought the day of the Lord had already come, Jesus had already come, and they missed it. And now what? If they died, are they going to be resurrected? Are they going to share in the glory of Jesus Christ? And then Paul says, remember what we preached to you, and he means himself, Silas and Timothy, that we brought to you the word of the Lord, and we told you that the man of lawlessness is coming. They knew who it was, as we saw last week. We don't that there is going to be restraint of the man of lawlessness. They knew what that meant. We don't exactly know what that means. And he talked about the great apostasy that was coming. They knew exactly what that meant. We didn't. There's mystery about the word of the Lord. There's a humility, as we said last time. But here's what we heard last time as well, that there is apostasy that comes in every age. And as the Thessalonians were being nailed with this false teaching that Jesus had already appeared, and that there was other false teachings that was going to lead to false practice, he says, remember what we taught you. Remember what we taught you about Jesus Christ. Remember the victory you have in Jesus Christ. And now Paul prays in thanksgiving for what God has done, moving us back to verse 3 of chapter 1. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing. We ought to. It is the right thing to do to thank God for what he's doing in the congregation. And then he connects that to uh, election, which goes back to the first letter, and we have that same kind of language, and now we're going to see it again. And what is that language? That God has chosen you to salvation. And we can only imagine the encouragement unto the, the emotions of peace and joy, but also a stick to Stand firm means keep on fighting. Stand up for Jesus as soldiers of the cross. And so our theme this morning is Paul encourages the Thessalonians with the hope of the glory of God, or the hope of the glory of Christ. First of all, we'll see that he brings a prayer, for he is thankful for salvation, and then he brings a prayer as a blessing for strength. And really, in a way, verse 15, so brothers and sisters, stand firm, hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter, kind of forms the center of what we're going to do this morning. Paul encourages the Thessalonians with the hope of the glory of Christ. There's those words again, but we, Paul, Timothy, and Silas, ought always to thank God for you. And again, we have that always is that regularly when they were coming together at the end of the day, probably in Corinth, and they're doing their devotions, they remember what God is doing in Thessalonica. There are these young people in the faith, so to speak, young Christians, lambs among the wolves, and God is doing something amazing in there. He he can't miss it, and he says, don't you miss it. And then he goes on, right, and he encourages them For you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits, or as we have said from the beginning, to be saved. Now, this little passage here, verses 13 and 14, uh, many actually call this a mini systematic theology. 
So later on, when he talks about in verse 15, hold fast to the teaching. The word teaching there actually means tradition. If you have your Bibles open, then you can see that there's a little footnote. In my Bible, it's A, or B, A rather, and, and B. And if you look down, it says traditions or tradition. Now, we'll talk about that in a moment. But we have some amazing things here. First of all, notice that you have God the Father who has saved you through the Holy Spirit to the glory of Jesus Christ. So there you have the Trinity. So let's talk about first about what God the Father is doing there. Well, he chose you. This is the doctrine of election. And it's a doctrine that's much maligned even into this day because they think it makes God unfair. But Paul uses it now to say, look, you thought you missed it. You thought Jesus had come and that you're not saved. And I'm telling you, we thank God because he chose you to be saved. Not on the basis that you loved him. Not because he looked down the road and thought, oh, well, they love me, so I will love them. No, he chose you to be saved. The doctrine of election gives us unspeakable hope and unspeakable encouragement in this life. You think about that. If you believe it's because God chose you, then if God chose you to be saved, that's unchangeable. There's nothing the devil can do. There's nothing the man of lawlessness can do. There's nothing the great apostasy can do. Even in the midst of restraint and in your life, in the difficulties of your life, <clears throat> maybe we're not facing oppression like they did in Thessalonica, and I don't think we are. But we do feel down. We can't get together. We are struggling with our, our, our life. Some of you struggle with deep sins and, and wondering about it. How can I even be saved? And then we remember, but if I believe, if Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, as we heard, if you but trust the Lord to guide you and you trust in his word, then you were saved. Because what did God do? Well, God gave to them the word. He gave to them the gospel, which Paul calls our gospel again, 1 Thessalonians, that when Paul preached, when Silas preached, when Timothy preached, when Pastor Richard Min preaches, when Pastor Greg preaches for us, or I preach, it should be the same gospel. The text will be different. The environment perhaps will be different. Our personalities are different. The way we bring it will be different. But the gospel is the same. The good news that sinners are saved through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ unto a renewing of your mind and unto a new life to be soldiers of the cross, to fight against darkness, and to bring good news into all the world if God sent you that good news, and he's doing it right now, and you believe it, then you can know you have been chosen. You can know you have been saved in spite of who you are, or in spite of what you've done, or in spite of what you think has happened. Get back to the truth of the wonder of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you believe? And if you believe, Hold fast to that amazing teaching. We ought always to thank God, family of God, brothers and sisters. Who are you? Loved by the Lord. Do you think of yourself that way? Because you need to more and more. Do you wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, I am loved by the Lord because Satan is telling you you're not. Satan is telling you, oh, your sins are too bad, or look at you, you're a dirty, rotten sinner, and on and on it goes. And then Paul says, no, you're chosen by Almighty God to be saved, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. That's not me talking, that's the Bible talking. You know, there's some people that want all the time to talk about, well, you should doubt, or you better not be too sure about it. Well, Paul doesn't seem to have a problem when he speaks to the saints in Thessalonica. And when we speak these words, we speak the truth in love. The opposite of faith is doubt. That's the work of the devil. The work of Paul is to say, I'm encouraging you in that truth. Maybe you're a parent and you're going through a tough time with your children. Maybe you're a teacher right now wondering what's going on with everything. Maybe you're a small businessman and, and you're wondering what's going on with your business. Or, or as a woman starting up something new, or have you lost your job? And it's, it's easy to get discouraged. And then you look in the mirror and you read these 
words. And as the Thessalonians were, I hope you could say for yourself, I am loved by God. Now the NIV uses the word chose you as the first fruits, and then there is that footnote that says from the beginning. It's one letter difference in the two words. The NIV has made the choice for first fruits because six other times Paul uses the word first fruits. And if we use the other word from the beginning, then that's the only time in the whole New Testament that Paul uses that word. So that's why the NIV has made that decision. But the King James Version, the New King James, um, and, and some of the older translations, but even a different version of, of uh, the NIV uses the words from the beginning. Now, I don't know that it makes a massive exegetical difference, but it makes more sense in the context to say he chose you from the beginning, understanding from eternity, before there was time, in time he let you know that you are saved. So God, outside of time, bursts into your time and says, you are loved. I have saved you. I am giving you eternity. From eternity, I've chosen you in time to give you eternity. If it's the other... And by the way, half of the manuscripts go one way and half go the other way. So it's an interesting discussion. But nonetheless, if it's first fruits, then the idea is, Thessalonians, you are that first generation of Gentile Christians, that first generation of the new church, the extension of Israel into the broadening into the world, that from you will come that idea of blessing for the rest of the generations to come. I Paul says, together with Paul and Silas, ought always to thank God for what he's doing because we understand that the end has not yet come, that the man of lawlessness has not yet come, and that you are the harbinger of things that are going to come in terms of the church of Jesus Christ, not only in Thessalonica, but in the whole world. Because remember, we talked about that, that that's probably God restraining the devil until the gospel goes into the four corners of the earth. And as it is in Thessalonica, so I hope it is in Toronto in our own congregation. It's amazing. And there is the beauty of it. We thank God that you are saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. God chose you not only then to be redeemed from sin and death and hell, to give you forgiveness of sins, justification by faith alone, through grace alone, You see how this little mini systematic theology works itself out? Doctrine matters, doesn't it? It helps us. It encourages us. You have been saved to be consecrated. That might be a better way to translate the word sanctified. Now, sanctified means the process of being made holy. Who does that? Generally, in the work of the Trinity, it's the Holy Spirit. So it means a couple of things. It means that you're taken out of the world and you're set apart. It means that there is a renewing of your heart and your mind, Romans chapter 12, which we read this morning for the law. That your lives might be set apart for sacrificial service to Almighty God, which is the work of the priests. The Holy Spirit has consecrated you, made you sacred as priests for God to serve him and worship him. We ought always to thank God that he did that in you. That where there was no worship of Almighty God in the truth of Jesus Christ, now in Thessalonica there is. Where there would not be this kind of worship in Toronto, there are churches that are worshiping God even today in the best way that we can, including, I hope, our own church and our own congregation. You have been set apart for that. Fundamental to evangelism, fundamental to our outreach, fundamental to what we do is your lives of holiness as priests set apart by Almighty God. Sanctifying work of the Spirit. And where does it start? Through belief in the truth. And there it is again, the doctrine. Do you believe? And if you can say, yes, Father in heaven, I believe you're my Father. I believe Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I believe then the Holy Spirit is in you. How awesome is that? And there's nothing that the devil can do No one can snatch you from the Father's hand. You are saved. You are set apart. You have been made holy. By the way, that makes you a saint. Not in the way the Roman Catholics understand a saint, but in the way the Bible understands saints. Saints are the sanctified ones. Isn't that you? I hope you're saying, yeah. 
You're right up there with Peter and Mary and all of them. Because they, like you, you, like them, have been set apart. Made holy by the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. For what? To share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And and again, don't miss it. You know, sometimes we are told as preachers, you shouldn't say we and our too much. But Paul has no problem. We ought to thank God, our gospel, and the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. If the preacher doesn't believe with you, if we don't share with you, what does it even mean? But we, together, beloved, share in the glorifying work of Jesus Christ. I know it's tough right now, but all of us who are here in this building, and I look and I can see faith, we're going to be in glory together. And even though we can't see all of each other right now, because you're in your homes and we're here, we will be in glory together. We move from the eternity of God's decision into the eternity of the death, the resurrection, the ascension, and the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you believe? Do you believe that God has saved you? How are we going to attain to the glory of Christ? God gives it to us. How are we going to attain to the glory of Jesus Christ? He gives it to us. How would we attain to the glory of Jesus Christ if we didn't believe the Holy Spirit gives it to us? You know what makes us ultimately holy, set apart, consecrated, sanctified? Now, we believe all this. The world thinks you're crazy. The world thinks I'm crazy. But not God. Not Jesus Christ. That is the great hope that encourages us. How do we stand firm in the great apostasy? Hold on, stand firm, hold fast. That means grab on tight to the teachings, the tradition, really. We passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. So Paul's written a letter. We know there was that forged letter. Hang on to the one I wrote. Hang on to this letter. Remember what we preached. Remember what Timothy preached. Remember what Silas preached. Hold on to that truth. Remember the words of the Old Testament. You Jews who have come out of the faith and now really understand the Old Testament. Move out of the synagogue. Move into the church of Jesus Christ. But whatever you do, know the truth. Hold on to the truth. See, tradition is is bad for us because the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church talks about the word of God and the tradition of the early church fathers. Although, interestingly, Even many newer Roman Catholic theologians are saying we probably shouldn't have said that. If the traditions don't agree with the word of God, we have a problem. But tradition for us, and if we're honest, since the 1960s, traditionalism has a bad name, doesn't it? Oh, traditions are bad. Bad traditions are bad. Good traditions aren't bad. When Paul uses the word tradition, and by the way, the NIV did make a choice for the word teaching here, which is okay, but really... That footnote is right. It should be tradition and traditions. Because the idea of a tradition is something that's good, that is believed by the group, and then is passed on to the next group, or that the new people who come would be taught. So the Apostles' Creed, which really is here, I believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, is our Father. He chose us in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ who is the Savior, through the power of the Holy Spirit, who gives to us faith so that we can belong to the Holy Catholic Church and we believe in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting, right? That's the truth of the Word of God that we hold on to and we pass on, and it's all there in this text. Traditions are not of themselves bad unless they're bad. Teaching. And so Paul says, hold on to what we taught. That's what's going to keep you on the straight and narrow. That's what's going to keep you on the the rocky path that leads to glory. But if we remember those words from Psalm 119, 105, your word, O Lord, is a lamp unto our feet, a guide unto our path. Paul's basically saying, look, here's the beauty of tradition. I'm going to die. Timothy's going to die. Silas is going to die. Richard Min is going to die. Greg Martin is going to die. Al Bazoon is going to die. But the word of the Lord stands forever. Didn't we read that from Psalm 103 this morning? That man is like grass, we flower, and then the wind blows over it, and no one even remembers us. But the word of the Lord stands forever. 
I saved you. I chose you to be saved. I made you holy. You are going to receive the glory of Jesus Christ. Are you struggling? Trust in the Lord to guide you. Are you wrestling with with a problem that you can't really resolve? Does it change the fact that you're saved? Does it? I've been thinking about a lot myself, e- even in this corona and, and, and church not being the way we want it to be, does that mean I'm not saved? And I have to say, it means just the opposite. Everything around me can change, but this is the rock truth in our life. God does not change. If you belong to him, you do. If you're saved, you're saved. Perseverance of the saints or the preservation of the saints, which is, which is knocked around. How can you say you're saved? See, here's the, the beauty of what Paul is saying. If my salvation is based on the decision of God, then I'm saved. If my salvation is based on my decision for God, I'm as saved as strong as my faith is in the moment. And sometimes in those moments, I'm not very strong. And then what? Do I have to worry all the time? No. Trust in the word hold fast be strong you are in a fight you are in spiritual warfare but christ has won the victory you have to go through the battle which you know you have already won you have to play the game you have to go through the valley of the shadow of death but the Lord who is our shepherd will lead and guide us. And in it, I'd like to pick up that shepherding part in our next point. Our blessing for strength and peace. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father. Interesting, right? Jesus and God the Father. So right away Paul is saying Jesus is God, the Father is God. They share the same purpose, the same will, the same power. And notice that there's a prayer there. And again, our God or our Lord Jesus Christ, God, our Father who loved us, by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. The power that we have, beloved, for each other and for one another is modeled here. The pastors of your church, the elders of the church, the deacons of the church, fundamental to our task is praying, but it's also yours. Do you pray that all of us will be kept strong? That all of us in this bizarre time, though we can't see each other, God still hears your prayers on our behalf. To just go through the church phone book or go through church social and pick a bunch of names and say, I'm going to pray for them today and be disciplined about it. We're going to have to find different ways to pastor each other, to love each other. Let's start with prayer. May our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father, and there it is again, who loved us. Isn't it amazing? You are loved. And if we are loved, we pray for those that he loves. That's beautiful, amazing words. Give us grace. By his grace. We don't deserve it. There's nothing we could do to earn it. As a matter of fact, if if God really looked at us and gave us what we deserve, he'd say, I'm walking by, but he doesn't. I love you. I love you in spite of who you are. There's a nice illustration of this in God's word in in the Gospel of Luke. In chapter 22, Jesus is heading off to the cross. He's headed off to Jerusalem. And Peter, bold Peter, you know, Lord, you don't have to go to the cross, and I'm going to take care of all these things, and you don't have to suffer. He just totally doesn't understand the call of his king, whom he serves. And then Jesus says these beautiful words to Peter. Peter, or Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, meaning the disciples. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, that you will strengthen the brothers. And that's exactly what happened. Satan sifted Peter. Three times he denied Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ came to him especially as we read in the Gospel of John, Peter, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And then he's restored, and then he ministers to his brother and begins the leadership of the Twelve until uh, the end of Acts where we see that the Apostle Paul uh, seems to take over that work. But Jesus said, Peter, you're in trouble. 
So I will pray that the Lord will protect you. Because that's what Jesus the shepherd does. Why? Because the Lord is our shepherd. If Jesus Christ is our shepherd, John 10, then Psalm 23, the Lord is our shepherd, God our Father, they're joined together, and we pray to them that they would look upon us in grace and mercy so that we would be encouraged. And notice it's an eternal encouragement. The sense of that is encourage your hearts. And and hearts there would be your inmost being. From, from your guts, from way deep within you, may you feel strong and sure and firm that God is my God, Jesus is my Savior, that the Holy Spirit is working that in you, holding fast to that. But he knows we waver. We're picking that up in the afternoon services, right? What are the sacraments for? To strengthen us in our doubt, to get us back to the cross, to the blood of Jesus, to the marvel and the wonder of salvation in a symbolic, pictorial Holy Spirit way. And that's what this is about. Without prayer, evangelism, being strong as a church, our congregational meeting that's coming up, is pointless. It's meaningless. Unless God is working in us to keep us strong, we will fall away. But we believe we will not because he will encourage our hearts and strengthen us. So Jesus said that what comes out of the heart of a man defines the man, or by their fruit you will know them. Why has God saved us? Why do we want that encouragement? And then he gets back kind of to where he started to strengthen you in every good deed and word. Faith without works is dead. It's meaningless if God has saved us that we can just sit on the couch and watch these TV, you know, worship via the TV or whatever you're watching it through your phone <clears throat> or the computer screen. And then it's over, and then we just go about our business. When the Spirit consecrates us, when we are made holy in Him, it changes what we do. It changes what we say. The simple thing, I was talking to one of our older members this week, and he'll smile when I say it, but he said, one of the things I've learned in talking in my building is I need to stop saying, I think. What do you think about Donald Trump? What do you think about Justin Trudeau? What do you think about abortion? What do you think about transgenderism? I think is meaningless. But when we say through the power of the Holy Spirit, God's word says this. But then you need to know where it says it in God's word and memorize it and speak it. Speak the truth in love. My opinion is meaningless. God's word is what matters. Can we speak that way? But then once we start speaking that way, how we behave, how we speak, how we handle ourselves, and we know we fall short, but hopefully more and more it matches up. So that as we live out of that marvelous good hope, the good hope that's rooted in God has saved me in the past, I do my good works and good works in the present, out of the wonder and the understanding that I am going to live with Jesus Christ and all of you who believe and who have dedicated your lives and and the way you live to the glory of God we will live together forever and ever. And in that hope and in that strength, we could go on. Now, part of what Paul is doing is, if you have your Bibles open, you can see the the second heading, beginning at verse 6 in chapter 3, is warning against idleness. Christians should not be lazy. Christians should be active in doing something. So he's foreshadowing that, which we hope over the next two weeks to get to. But until then, beloved, live in this hope. You are loved if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. If you have faith, it's because God loved you. Don't be afraid. Don't get too rattled. Don't get too upset. Hey, look, even if you lost your business, but you gained heaven, so what? So maybe your kids aren't listening to you, but if God loves you, so what? Don't get too uptight, but be encouraged in these great words of hope of the glory of God that you share in now and that you will share forever until Jesus Christ comes again. And then you see the power and the beauty of the tradition. That's why I think as a church, I hope as a church, we'll continue to teach catechism. We need to somehow figure that out over the next coming months again. That we'll teach new members the great truths of our word. We'll preach from the catechism and from the Belgic Confession. We'll teach from it so that when we understand that they really do come from the Bible, 
these truths will hold us fast. And as the beautiful song goes, he will hold me fast. Why? Because as we're going to sing, his faithfulness is great. Morning by morning, new mercies we see. And what can we say then? If God is for us, who can be against us? God has chosen you, Christian, to be saved, made holy for him, to share in the glory of Jesus. Believe it. It is so. Thus says the Lord. Amen. Father in heaven, we love you, we worship, and we adore you. Glorify your name in all the earth. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Father, if any who are listening are struggling with their faith, help their unbelief. If there are those who have no faith, Lord, grant it to them. And for those of us who are strong in faith, we pray, God, that you would help us all, weak or strong, to minister to one another, to be in prayer for one another, to love one another as best as we can. That people would see in us the reason to thank you. And Lord, we do thank you. What you did in the life of the Thessalonian congregation, in the life of Paul and Silas and Timothy, and even in our own lives. May Jesus Christ be praised. In his name we come. Amen. Thank you.